All right, hopefully we have sound. All right, so we're looking at the best things in the life of the church and uh, the things that are peculiar to, not peculiar to, but pertain to the matter of the local congregation and uh, as opposed to, say, the, the universal church, although these things should hold true no matter where one might go. And I, I have found these things to be true uh, in my uh, travels around the country and been blessed to go in other places around the world. And uh, the brethren have treated me uh, as if I were uh, a local everywhere I've ever been, and I'm thankful uh, for that. So we're looking at the word life, life, the best things in the life of the church, using the word life as an acronym. And so, um, and so the first thing that we want to think about with regard to the church is the matter of love, is that the church should be a place that is filled with love. And uh, it is a love that is contrasted with the love of the world. Uh, the love of the world is fickle. We can look at the parable of the prodigal and look at how the young man wasted his living or wasted his possessions in riotous living. And we would expect that while he had money, he had lots of so-called friends. And, but when the money ran out, you know, the friends dried up as well. We think about the love of the world, and I, I thought about it in this term, uh, of Matthew chapter uh, 21 uh, in the triumphal entry that the, 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 the very people who, who, welcomed, you know, who welcomed the Christ into uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, later found um, room to cry out, crucify him. And, you know, that's just a very short period of time. And so the love of the world is a fickle love. I'll give you one example just, well, no, I won't because I don't want to get off too far. But think about some things about the, the love that is, in, that is in the church. First is the love of God, the love of God. In 1 John 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, Let us love not in word, but in deed and in truth. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we aren't to love in word, but rather that our love is shown not by our words, but by our deeds, uh, which are done in truth. And so we think about the, the love of God. The love of God is not just love that is in word. Uh, that love has been manifested. In other words, it's in deed and it's in truth. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for a venture for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we see the demonstration of the love of God. Uh, in other words, we know that God loves us, not because simply because the Bible says it, but because we can see what God has done for us uh, of his own free will, of his own volition, without anything that we have ever or could ever do to deserve it. Uh, in 1 John 4 and verses 7 through 11, uh, we, know, we see that God is love, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. Uh, we love God because he first loved us, 1 John 4 and verses 20 and 21. So uh, the love of God is, is a great uh, a great part of um, the life of the church. Then there's the love of Jesus Christ. In, uh, in John 14 and verse 21 and following, uh, we see that Jesus speaks about uh, uh, the love that he has uh, for us. Uh, you think about John 13, 34 and 35, where to love one another. This kind of a transition passage because he says, love one another as I have loved you, and as I've loved you, you love one another. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. And so we, we have this bar that's been set for us, which is the love of Christ. And, and that, is, that is the only measuring stick of love, is the love of Christ. And that our love for one another is to imitate uh, the love that Jesus has for us as individuals, his love that he has for for the church. And so there's the love of God, there's the love of Christ, there's the love of brethren. In uh, Luke chapter 6, Jesus spoke about uh, the matter of that when we are in the body of Christ, that, uh, that we 
have a giant extended family. Um, I, and I'll give you an example. Um, in uh, 2001, we had uh, some, some fellow preachers and I had just returned from Ghana, West Africa, just days before 9-11. And, of course, we know, or those of us that are old enough to remember or have studied, you know, you know, all airlines were shut down. You know, er, you know, every airport in the world was shut down after that. Nobody went anywhere. And, and, of course, I was thankful to be home. But at the same time, I knew that, you know, if that had happened while I was stuck uh, or on a layover in, um, at uh, Heathrow uh, Airport in London, uh, we had brethren. We had brethren there that we knew we could count on. If it had happened while I was actually, you know, on the ground in Ghana, we, I had brethren there. I didn't have to worry uh, because I know the love of the brethren around the world. And so uh, that's a marvelous thing uh, to think about. And Jesus says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, and sh shall men uh, uh, give into your bosom. And so we think, about, we think about all the blessings of our extended spiritual family as a part of the love that is in that is in the church, and I, and I have found that, uh, I found it in the United Kingdom, I found it in Ghana, I found it in Liberia, I found it in Kenya, it's just, a, it's a marvelous thing, and I know that other friends of mine have traveled to other places around the world, and, and it's all the same, everywhere they go, uh, the love of brethren just is, is phenomenal, and it's a great thing about being a member of the body of Christ. Um, then I want to think one more thing about with the love of the brethren, and that is this. And, and by the way, this also goes to the matter of the love of God, and, and, and that is this, that simply because someone, or just because someone loves us doesn't mean that we are going to appreciate necessarily everything that they do. In other words, uh, uh, people that, that we love can do things that we don't approve of but it doesn't mean we stop loving them. And then an extension of that, when a Christian becomes unfaithful and brothers and sisters in Christ admonish and encourage a person to leave the, the filth of the world and come back to a relationship with, with the Lord, they're not doing that so they can badger you or make you feel bad or, or whatever. It's that they love you and they don't want you to suffer the consequences of the path that you're on when you leave the Lord. Uh, Jude 20, the 23rd verse of Jude said, Others save with fear, snatching them from the fire. You know, we think about, you know, a fireman carrying someone out over his shoulder, you know, saving their life uh, by, by toting them out uh, of a burning building. They've snatched them out of the fire. But there's a fire far worse than a house fire or a building fire. And, and that's the fire of hell. And when we admonish and encourage unfaithful brethren to come home, it's because we're trying to we're trying to save their souls from hell. And they may think, "Well, I wish they'd quit. I wish they'd leave me alone. I wish they'd quit bothering me." Can't do it. Can't do it. Love you too much. Don't want don't want those uh, those types of things uh, to happen to you. And so that's a, just another part of the love of uh, our brethren. And so. Love is an important part in the life of the church. And then, secondly, the letter I is the word is the word inclusion. The word inclusion. And that's an important word because the church should always be a place of inclusion. And we would say conversely, even though the church is an exclusive body, it's not a place for exclusion. And what I mean by that is, that you know, the church is not just some is not just some nebulous idea uh, that people can't truly get their mind around, or or that or that the you might say that the borders of the kingdom are unknown. No, that's not it. That's not that's not the church. We can know if we're members of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is an exclusive body. It's the only body that's going to be delivered up uh, to God when Jesus comes back. First Corinthians fifteen twenty three. And 24, he's the savior of the body, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 uh, through 25. So the church is an exclusive group in the sense that few will be saved. 
You know, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, you know, few there be that find it, you know, entering in at the straight and narrow, uh, the straight gate, the narrow way. Few there are who find it. And so the church is an exclusive body, but it's not an exclusionary body. And what I mean by that is, is that all those who are willing to submit themselves to God in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and desire and do their best to live according to the precepts set forth uh, by the Lord and his apostles in the New Testament, that there is no room for any type of exclusion. Uh, in other words, there's no reason. Uh, in other words, th there are no levels of membership or there's no trial period. Uh, there's no probationary period. You know, a person is either a member of the body of Christ or they are not a member of the body of Christ. And, uh, and so as we think about, you know, there are some ways in which the, in the minds of men, they seek to exclude others, even within the body of Christ. For example, we cannot exclude people on the basis of their sin. In other words, if I obey the gospel, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all my sins. Now, you may think that my sins that I committed before I became a member are worse than the ones that you committed before you became a member, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. The Bible says that, 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 that all of us have received the grace of God when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and again, it, it, as there's an old saying that the, the, all the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so we don't, we don't or cannot exclude people based on what we perceive to be uh, their sins before they became members. We don't exclude them uh, based on their ability or lack of ability. Or we don't exalt ourselves uh, over others because of our abilities. Um, you know, in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, Paul said, What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you act like you didn't receive it? And so, uh, you know, the, you know people, uh, people seek to be exalted or people seek to exalt others based on, uh, based on their abilities, but the, the body of Christ has to work together. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27 speaks about the, the nature of the body and that all the parts have to work, uh, all the parts have to work together. And, uh, and so uh, uh, with that in mind, we don't exclude people based on sin. We don't exclude people based on ability or what we perceive as lack thereof. Uh, we don't exclude people based, and this kind of goes with sin, based on their past. You know, people were afraid of the Apostle Paul when he or actually Saul of Tarsus when he obeyed the gospel, but Barnabas stood up for him and took him and introduced him to the apostles. And, and, and so, you know, and Paul had a, for, for, from a Christian perspective, Paul had a sordid past. Not that he was a vile sinner and that he participated in iniquity, that the world, you know, the vileness of, of, of worldly type sins, but he, he tortured and persecuted Christians and gave his voice against them when they were put to death and so he had a pretty bad past and 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 in some ways I don't think Paul ever got past it in his mind in insofar as he that he never did forget it in other words he he, he always remembered uh, how the grace of God had lifted him up he said Christ came to this world to save sinners of whom I am chief first Timothy 1 and verse 15 and so we don't exclude people based on uh, their past uh, also, I would add this. We don't exclude people based on their social status. In James chapter 2, even though it's not an absolute case of exclusion, it is kind of a case of exclusion. James says, the, the rich man comes in and you give him the best seat and the poor man comes in and you have him sit down here below your feet. Now, basically, what are you saying? You're saying to the poor man, based on nothing more than, than, than his social status, that he's not as worthy as the rich man. And so uh, James says, have y'all forgotten? It's the rich man that drags you into court. It's the rich man that, that, that causes you all of your troubles. The poor man didn't do this. The rich man did. And so we don't exclude uh, based, on, based on social status. And uh, I'll just be honest with you, um, I mean, it, 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 sometimes it bothers me to see these giant cathedrals that are that that my brethren are building, because they don't they don't speak to inclusion. Uh, they don't speak to inclusion, and and I think 
many times people can be intimidated by those things, but you know, but we're proud of them, you know. And, and so, you know, I think I think we do well. I think we do well to consider a few things along those lines to give people the give people the idea and, and the right idea that that all folks are welcome here regardless of social status. And then lastly, and I saved, I saved this one for last because uh, I've got several things I'm going to say about it, but there is no place for exclusion based on skin color. Um, it, I, I don't like black churches and white churches. Uh, I just don't like it. I, I don't see the need for it. I don't think, it, I don't think it's helpful. Um, you know, the, you, the difference in American blacks and American whites is not nearly as vast as the difference between Jews and Gentiles, and yet we don't read about Jewish churches and Gentile churches. You know, we read about Jews and Gentiles. And look, it doesn't mean that everything was always you know hunky dory between them, that there weren't some issues between the Jews and the Gentiles, but they were able to work through those things and worship and serve God together uh, at a single location. Now, now. I understand that sometimes when you live in an area that, that is dominated by blacks or whites or Asians or, or whatever, that it's just going to be natural that that's going to be the case, but that's not always the case. And so there's no place, there's no place in the church for exclusion based on skin color or any other immutable uh, characteristic. Um, it, and and the, the, the history of the church has not been good um, through the, with regard to... to uh, the desegregation, uh, Christian schools and uh, colleges, and, and even our own congregations. Uh, I thank God for men like A.M. Burton, who, you know, who used you know, portions of his, his vast fortune uh, to help Marshall Keeble uh, travel the country and preach, and preach the gospel and uh, believed in him. And, and literally thousands and thousands of people uh, will be in heaven because of the work of those two men uh, working together. And so I just, uh, I, again, I just, I just don't, I don't like it. Um, and so, I, and because we shouldn't see people or, or, or distinguish among people based on their immutable characteristics. And, and so, and, and I'll just say, I'll just say this as well. Um, you know, it bothers me, it bothers me when I hear my black folks uh, my black brethren talk about our people. You know, look, if you ever hear me use the term my people or our people, I'm talking about my kin folks or my church folks. But I sure ain't talking about white folks. And if you don't like when people judge you or make distinguishing uh, uh, ideas based on your immutable characteristics, then you need to stop distinguishing yourselves by your immutable characteristics. Saw a picture of a, 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 a brother posted on Facebook not long ago. It's, it's five, five brothers that said, five black men who love the Lord. Well, you, po you posted a picture. I can, I can see the picture. I, 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 know what, I know what color you are. Yeah. It would never occur to me if, if me and four of my white preacher friends got our picture made to say, here's five white men who love the Lord. Or if it was some kind of a mixture, here's two white men, two black men, and an Asian man who love the Lord. You know, that, 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 that's just foolishness, and, and it's not helpful. And, and so we need to stop identifying ourselves by our immutable characteristics and separating ourselves by our immutable characteristics. Look, we're not going to be a colorblind society. Even the Bible speaks to this matter that, you know, M Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Now, Moses was a dark-skinned man, but the Ethiopian was probably a darker-skinned woman. You have the, the, the Shunammite uh, of the Song of Solomon uh, spoke about that she was a extremely dark-skinned. You know, what, it's not a matter of being colorblind. It's a matter of not caring. You know, I don't care what color you are. That, that's the, only, that's the, the colorblind part's foolish. We, we, you, you're going to see it. But it's that you don't care. And so we've got to stop identifying ourselves by immutable characteristics. Again, you know, and, and I've, had, I've had some of my black brethren say, you know, talk about our people or my people, and they're talking about black people. 
and, and until that kind of stuff stops, our problems are not our problems are not going to be solved. And and no one denies no no one denies that racism still exists. It, you'd be a fool you'd be a fool to, to argue otherwise. But we have to stop identifying ourselves by these things. And uh, there's no room for exclusion based on these things. I don't get to be proud to be white because I didn't have nothing to do with it. You don't get to be proud to be black because you didn't have anything to do with it. You know, tall people seem to take pride in being tall. Well, guess what? You didn't choose to be tall. And you can't change being tall. Matthew chapter 6, which one of you, by, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? You know, whether you're tall or short or fat or skinny or white or black, whatever it is, that's what you are, and you didn't choose that. You know, well, you might have chose to be fat because you ate too much. But in, in, in most cases, these are things that we have no control over, don't have any control over. And we need to stop, we need to stop taking pride in things that don't have anything to do uh, with anything other than what God has done for us. And then number three, the letter F. The letter F is the matter of fellowship. In, first, uh, excuse me, in Psalm 133 and verse 1, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For brethren to dwell together in unity. The fellowship of the Lord's body is, should be one of its greatest calling cards. Uh, the love of the church, the inclusive nature of the church, the fellowship of the church. You think about the, the Macedonians in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, how they beyond their ability and out of their deep poverty, gave to help the brethren in Judea, even though they never met those brethren. But what had happened? They knew the brethren in Judea had financed the work of the Apostle Paul and others to get the gospel to them. Therefore, they felt a deep and abiding uh, 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 need, or, or, or we might say uh, obligation, help those brethren in matters of a physical nature when they know that those folks had helped them financially, but ultimately uh, uh, they'd helped the preachers financially, but to bring them the gospel and help them in spiritual matters. And so the fellowship, the sharing uh, that uh, is to exist uh, among brethren. I, you know, I, I love the term fellowship meal. You know, we talk about having a fellowship meal. Well, what is that? That's, that's all the brethren get together and, and those that can bring, well, you know, around here, you know, we might have 60 people and we have enough food for 200. Why? Because that's what we do. We're going to, we're going to bring of our abundance. And, and if you didn't bring, you know, we always say this, please stay. Even if you didn't bring anything, if you're a visitor, we know you didn't bring anything and you didn't know, please stay. You know, share in our abundance. And, and that's not just, again, that's not just in matters of meals, but in, in just spending time with brethren. I, there's no, there are no people in the world that I'd rather be with uh, than my brethren. I love the fellowship of brethren. And so uh, I, I think about that. And then lastly is the matter of edification. The matter of edification. In uh, Romans 14 and verse 19 and Romans 15 and verse 2, we're to pursue peace and how we are to please our neighbor. In Hebrews 3 and 13, we're to exhort one another daily. But I love the text of 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Therefore, comfort one another and edify one another, even as you are doing. By the way, if you go back one chapter to chapter 4, to verses 9 and 10, Paul says to those brethren, commends them for their love. First they're commended for their obedience, then they're commended for their love for one another, and then they're, comm they're commended for their edification of one another. And so you, know, I, I, you think about, you know, we usually don't think about the Thessalonian church as being you know, a great model uh, uh, of the brethren, but when you read, when you read 1 Thessalonians, uh, you'll find that that church was, that was an incredible, that was an incredible group of people, and, 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 and certainly a, a group of people who have many, many characteristics that need to be studied and need to be uh, emulated. And so, the, the, you know, the church, to me, uh, 
I've heard it said many times, and I think this is true, that the church is a slice of heaven on earth. It's, it's, it should be the nearest thing to heaven uh, that you're going to find on this earth. And it's the, again, it's the only body, it's the only group that's going to survive when Jesus comes back. It's the only, it's the only body that's going to be, be translated from earth to heaven when the Lord returns. And, and if, you're, if you're not a member of the church, uh, I'd, I'd hope that, that some of these things that we've talked about would encourage you uh, to, to at least investigate what it means to be a member uh, of the Lord's church. And if I can help you in, in that respect, and I've, got, I've put the number up here. I just decided I'd keep this up here tonight. Um, if you've got questions or comments or anything that we can help you with, you can send it. That's our Google. You can leave a voicemail at that number, or you can send a text message uh, to that number. And we'd be, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. But we want to thank you for being with us tonight and for uh, being part of our study. We're going to close with a word of prayer and then another word or two and we'll be finished for the evening. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for, again, this day and this opportunity. And we're thankful for the church and we're thankful for what it means to uh, so many of us. Father, we know uh, that the church was, was always in your plan and that uh, from all eternity that you have... Uh, have made provisions uh, for the establishment and the continuance uh, of the church. We're thankful that it's been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're thankful for your great love that, that sent Jesus and for his love for us that he was willing to come uh, and to die for the church, to purchase it with his blood. And Father, we uh, pray that we'll be uh, faithful members of it and ready when you send Jesus back uh, to gather it and take it home in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Lord willing, on Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock, we'll, uh, we'll be back uh, for our morning worship and then again at 5.30, and we hope that you'll take uh, time to be with us then or at least catch us at a later point in time, and we just look forward to seeing you then again. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight, and uh, again, if the Lord wills, we'll see you this coming Sunday morning. Have a great evening.